Hey everybody, it's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District coming at you for my favorite time of the week, Local Heroes. Uh, today's Friday, April the 23rd. We kick off the last week of April um, in recognizing two great local heroes um, who uh, are with us on the day that the new Josiah Henson Museum and Park are opening. Um, and uh, in some sense, they're reopening because there have been visits before, but in terms of really the full museum being there, the total experience, it's opening today and everybody's got to check it out. Um, so I am going to recognize as our local heroes, uh, Mark Thorne, who's the historic site manager for the new Josiah Henson Museum and Park. And he's been uh, in um, the field of uh, uh, Montgomery County uh, museums and museums generally. Uh, he was a youth interpreter at the Capitol Children's Museum. Um, and he's been a muse museum professional for National Children's Museum for a long time. He joined Montgomery Parks in 2016 as program manager for the Woodlawn uh, Manor Cultural Park, where he helped to open up the Woodlawn Museum and expand all of its offerings. Welcome to you, Mark, and congratulations. And we're also joined by Cassandra Michaud, who is the senior archaeologist with Montgomery Parks generally and leads the uh, archaeological investigations unit at the Josiah, uh, Josiah Henson site. And she has more than 25 years of experience in the field studying the archaeological past. And she spent the last dozen years focused on Montgomery County um, through her work leading um, on the investigation of these archaeological sites on park land. So we're thrilled to have both of you here. Um, we've talked uh, once or twice before about the Josiah Henson Museum, but I'm so excited about it. And Mark, I thought maybe you could kick us off uh, by describing generally what the project is. Again, who was Josiah Henson and why is he important for everybody who lives in our area to know about? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, it is an exciting day, the opening of the Josiah Henson Museum and Park. And I think what makes Josiah Henson himself in, uh, an interesting person is that he, he tells his life is a story of resilience, right? He was born a slave in um, Port Tobacco, Maryland. Um, but made his way to, to the Raleigh Plantation here on Old Georgetown Road. And um, he started out as a sickly child, but he grew up to be a strong man, uh, so strong that he was assigned to be the caretaker and overseer of the property where he was enslaved. Now, through, um, through that experience and some of the tasks that he was handed, he... Uh, he traveled to Kentucky and eventually escaped. And, and that starts the, the, the part of the story that a lot of us know, because when he moved to Canada, he established a community for slaves that made their way to freedom in Canada. And that was a, a trade school and, he, and gave the opportunity for those that made their way there to improve their lives. And he actually came back to Kentucky and helped 118 enslaved laborers make it to freedom um, on the Underground Railroad. So aside from, the, from being a, a founder of this community, this resilient man, he was a, 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 a pastor of a church. He was an abolitionist, but he was also an author. And he was an author in that he wrote a book, um, his own narrative, to explain to people about his story, his life, in an effort to raise money to free his brother. And that book inspired Harriet Beecher Stowe to write her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which we know is, was one of the most owned book during the time, second only to the, to, the, to the Bible. And it was a book that changed the trajectory of slavery in this country. Um, and that impact started with his life here on Old Georgetown Road, and that um, impacted the history of this entire country. So it's not just Maryland history, it's not just African-American history, but it is a huge part of American history. And Mark, tell us, um, if we were to come to the Josiah Henson Museum, um, what would we experience there? What would we find there? And uh, do say a word about the parking, because I know that there's a little sensitivity about that too. 
Well, thank you for mentioning that. One of the challenges is that we are um, the the home that we converted the into a museum is located in a um, residential community. So the closest parking to our, our site is um, at the Shriver Aquatic Center located at Wall Local Park. But when they come to uh, make it across the street to our museum, the first thing I hope they say is, wow. Um, and wow is our, they'll see our visitor center, a brand new vis visitor center where guests will start their experience. They will come in our, theater, our 88-seat theater, and experience um, an orientation film that gives people the basics about Josiah Henson's life. Once they've watched this orientation film, they then make their way um, through our park, um, which is, which is a very scenic. Um, I like to call it my oasis here on Old Georgetown Road. Um, but they'll navigate my o oasis and make it to the museum, which is in the historic Raleigh Bolton House. And that's where they will see a collection of um, exhibits and um, multimedia presentations that tell a little bit about his story, his life. Um, and they also get to understand how, how his story has um, kind of been mutated and changed in the way it's been told over time. Um, Uncle Tom, you know, at one point in time, Josiah Henson celebrated the idea of being called Uncle Tom, but later in his life, he didn't. And that was because there were efforts by those on um, the pro-slavery movement to kind of um, do this uh, misinformation campaign to, to, to destroy his legacy. And it's part of our job here is to reestablish that legacy and to uh, explain to people that Josiah Henson, not Uncle Tom, but Josiah Henson was a remarkable man and um, an important part of our history. Well, wow, what an extraordinary story it is to have you recover that whole history and recover the man in his full three-dimensionality, uh, his own real life and his own real work and his own writing, very different from uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's version and very different than even from the image and the stereotypes that arose after the publication of her book and after the war. Um, well, thank you so much for that. Um, Cassandra, let me ask you, you are the senior archeologist of Montgomery Parks. I take it you've been spending a lot of your time on the investigation at the Josiah Henson site. Um, tell us sort of what your average day has been like there, what you do as the chief archeologist there. And then also after that, if you don't mind, um, Defend for us uh, the fact that Montgomery County has an archaeologist. I mean, I happen to think it's the coolest thing in the world, but I can't imagine most counties and most cities have their own archaeological teams. But I think it's a pretty great statement about who we are in Montgomery County that we've got somebody employed to do what you do. So if you could answer those two questions. Absolutely. I, um, uh, I would be happy to do that. So we sort of the average day, there is really no average day in archaeology. We sort of we can never predict what we're going to find because, you know, we really can't see in the ground. So an average day, a typical day could be doing a lot of background research, a lot of historical research, going to the site, beginning an excavation, excavating, dealing with whatever we find under the ground. And at a site like Josiah Henson, which has been lived on, has been occupied for 200 years, right? So people have been on that site since 1800 or earlier continuously. And the story of that site is actually the story of Montgomery County in its transition from a plantation to a farm after, uh, after emancipation, and then to a tenant farm, and then to a series of private owners that are subdivided individual houses. The farm got sold off, and now it's a, a public museum. And that sort of represents the trajectory of the county. And so our, when we go to the site, we, we can ex be excavating. And then when we recover the material, we'll go back to the lab and we actually spend more time in our lab in another part of the county processing the material. We'll wash it, we'll identify it, we'll catalog it, and then we'll analyze it because everything we do is systematic. We dig systematically, we catalog systematically, and it's through that sort of procedure that we're able to come up with patterns. And that's what we're looking for is patterns in the ground, patterns in the artifacts that can tell that we can draw our inferences from. 
So before construction, we did a lot of that kind of excavation. We were actually on site until construction almost ended because as they were digging in the ground and excavating, they were still finding material and we were on site monitoring it during construction, recovering information as that was happening to make sure that we don't lose it. Archaeological sites are incredibly fragile. You only get one chance to recover the information. Uh, they're non-renewable, so it doesn't matter if I dig it or someone else digs it, that information is gone if once it becomes um, removed from the ground. So our process is to be systematic and record everything. And sort of just to follow into that, the next question. Well, wait, but before you get to the next one, let me ask you yeah. this, just following up. So do you have the legal chain of custody, all of the deeds to the various owners going all the way back to the time of Josiah Henson before you started? And then, so, and then yeah. as you get, as you, dug into the dirt, you were able to find physical remnants and relics from each occupant and owner of the home? That, so that's exactly right. I mean, I wouldn't, it isn't each and every, but it is pretty close. And so before we begin any excavation, we do a tremendous amount of research um, to know, to sort of lay a framework, and we call it a research design. What are we going to find? What, is, what do we think we're going to find? And what kind of questions are we trying to answer? Because we're always trying to answer a question when we go out in the field. We aren't just randomly digging. And in fact, our, our historian, Jamie Coons, actually was able to reconstruct the ownership history of the property all the way back. And so we knew it, it extended back a certain time, and we were able to identify through the artifacts that we recovered different areas of the property that dated to, say, 1890 or 1850 or 1920, and what was going on on the site at that time because the artifacts were there because of the way we recovered them. So, yeah, we can trace, uh, in, you know, there's inter individual pieces of jewelry, there's individual pieces of ceramics that we can date very specifically and tie them to a specific family, not an individual by the specific family who was living there. Huh. Okay, and then, so uh, well, what's the social benefit and utility of doing all of this? So, the be I'll tell it through the story of this site, right? So our, you know, Mark just talked about sort of the goal of the, the museum and talking about Josiah Henson and his amazing story. The goal of the archeology span is not only to talk about his story, but to talk about the other enslaved who are on this property, because there were, as, as many as 25, you know, at times it was less, at times it was more, over the years that it was a plantation. And it's our job to find their story. We don't know all their names. They're not recorded in historical documents. Historical documents and other structures of, you know, society are in fact biased and they create invisibilities for certain populations. Our goal is to find those people because whether or not they're in a document or in a deed or in a map, whether we know their name, we know they existed on the landscape and we can find the physical remains of them existing. We can find the artifacts that they left in the ground. And in fact, we have found structures we didn't know about exist, that, that we didn't know existed on the property, that date to the time when there was enslavement on this property. And we're able to reconstruct what might have been their daily life in that in that structure and on the plantation. And even though the plantation, we don't know their names, we know that they're the ones who, who built the walls and they're the ones who are farm the fields and they're the ones who made the, that landscape, made the food in the kitchen. One of the features we found was a kitchen midden that dates to the very early part of the 19th century. And it has a lot of remains from the food and from the kitchen. And we're able to get a sense of, it's a very an immediate sense of what they were doing in that moment. And that's not recorded in documents. And if we rely only on sort of what we ex um, understand to be accepted fact or accepted history, we miss out on the opportunity to understand that there are often uh, different interpretations, sometimes quite intentionally false interpretations about what happened 200 years ago, 500 years ago, however many years ago. 10 years ago, that we can help to supplement and cr maybe correct. And in this case, I would say we are, in fact, raising the, the visibility of a population that I know I grew up in Montgomery County. I did not know there was slavery in Montgomery County when I was in high school. My sons now do know that, not only because they're my sons and they come to the site and they had no choice, but they now learn it in school. And we can now talk about that in a very material way that uh, you cannot get at in any other way through archaeology, and that extends not just to an enslaved community, but to the Native histories and all those, the rest of the histories for everybody. Well, that's fascinating, and thank you so much, Cassandra. Mark, I'll give you the final word here. Uh, Cassandra mentioned her sons. Uh, are you expecting that this is going to be a destination site for uh, school classes, 
for young people, summer camps. Um, who are you expecting to come here? Who do you want to come to be part of it? And do you think this is going to end up being a very big deal draw for our county? Um, yes, yes, and yes. Um, I, first of all, I, I think it will be a draw not just for for local um, local citizens that are curious about our site, curious about the construction. We you would be amazed at how many local people just walk walk up or drive up just to know what's going on. But I think we will we will continue the work that we've done in developing dynamic programming for schools. For schools for schools to come out and to um, to experience the programming on site but we're also um, already looking at ways to do some virtual programming our education program manager recently did a virtual tour for 130 students in Dallas Texas so we've already started before our doors have opened with uh, doing programming for for students not just locally but for students in the in the country and i think that the relationships that we've established with the harriet beecher stowe center in connecticut and the uncle tom center in ontario canada will help we think make this an international destination um, not just standing alone as a dynamic and amazing museum but in working in collaboration with these other museums that continue to tell the full story of Josiah Henson and his impact um, moving forward. Well, look, uh, you have really whetted everybody's appetite to come and check it out. Um, I've been, and I think it's just enthralling. It's just totally captivating. And it's, uh, it's a great compliment to the wonderful sites that we have about the Underground Railroad, too, now, which are about you know, the escape to freedom and exodus uh, from slavery. And yours is really about well, what was life actually like on the inside for people who were enslaved uh, at that point, as well as giving all this great insight into the life of this remarkable man, Josiah Henson. So look, for um, all of the fantastic work that you guys have done uh, because of the unveiling of the new Josiah uh, Henson Museum and Park, uh, you are our local heroes for this final week of uh, April 2021. Uh, Mark Thorne and Cassandra Michaud, thank you for what you've done for our community, and we will see you out at the museum and park. Thank you, Congressman. Thank, thank you, you, Cassandra. Thank you, Mark.